live on uh, eastmojo.com. I think we still are. Uh, Konkon, if you can confirm if we are live. Yeah, we are live on eastmojo.com. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting conversation. I'm sure uh, most of us are fatigued with Zoom, na? Zoom or all the online uh, conferences. And I keep, I think today I'm going to keep having to look for the, you know, subconsciously looking for the unmute button. Because I keep forgetting that there is an unmute button and I'm looking for the unmute button just now. Even when he gave me the mic, I was saying, where's my unmute button? So now I have unmuted myself. Uh, so I, I, I just want to do it uh, slightly uh, differently uh, today. And uh, so... So I'll request Angelica uh, to introduce all the speakers in your, yeah, okay. So uh, we are joined now on uh, stage by my friend uh, Angelica Aribram. She is the founder of uh, Fem First, uh, Miss uh, Lalita Kumara Mangalam, BJP leader, I'm sure. Uh, you have seen her on TV multiple times. Most of the time she's there on TV, yeah? Speaking her mind out, and she doesn't shy from even taking sometimes lines which are not according to her party. And she, I think she loves to do that. It comes naturally to her. Uh, Somia Reddy is there. Welcome to my, uh, what to say, friend uh, from a city which has given me so much, Bangalore. So thank you. Swagata, Suswagata. I need to brush up on my Kannada a little bit, but hmm? yeah. Solpa Solpa Burute, Jasti Barala. Yeah. I can make do with that. So, what I'll do today is uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, like the Zoom meetings where you put your screen off and go to sleep, I can finally see you. I'm so happy to see everybody and do this in person, you know. It's something new. It's like a wow moment for me that I'm finally doing a live session uh, with an audience. So what I'll do is, we've got uh, three uh, very interesting women leaders who have, uh, you know, made themselves known despite all the challenges. One from the northeast, two from the south. You know, sometimes uh, I feel that the northeast and South India have a kindred connection uh, because, uh, you know, we are quite similar by location. So there is a thread that runs around, like East Mojo, my cousin or somebody I work closely is with the News Minute. So those guys are really receptive. We talk to each other all the time. So that is the connection I feel and that is the connection I see happening here. So what I want you to do is I want uh, three volunteers, uh, possibly students if they are there, uh, if not students, then uh, whoever wants to volunteer, I just want you to get up and tell us uh, what you want to do in life, yeah, and, and, and why. It's a request. That's, that's how I thought we'd make it very informal. Then your connection will be one of the uh, uh, women here on stage, leaders here on stage, and we will make that connection. So can we have three volunteers? From the audience? So, yeah, okay. We'll get you a mic. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, we're going to do this panel discussion slightly differently. Yeah, so, so your name... Uh, what do you want to do in life and why? All right, so good afternoon. I guess it's past 12 p.m. right now. Yeah, so I am Himparna Das and I'm currently doing my graduation in Cotton University itself in the Department of Geology. And if you ask me what I want to do in my life, something that I've always felt while growing up is that uh, my presence should matter in a particular situation 
or even entering a particular room, my presence should bring up an optimistic view or a positive influence with the people I'm surrounded with. And if you ask me what I want to do in my life, career-wise, I am aspiring to be a civil servant, and hence I was very interested about this particular conclave. And if you ask me why a civil servant, I think uh, there is no other good deed to use the power to make an influence in a good way in somebody else's life. If you're able to empower others, if you're able to help others through your own deeds, I think uh, you have already, you know, fulfilled what you have been, you know, created to be done in this world. So that is it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So stay on. I just have one more thing of you to do. So you have uh, three wonderful leaders here, yes. all of through, and uh, Abhi Nandita Dayal Mathur, advisor, government of Delhi is also here, so it's, it's four. So I want you to choose one out of the four to be your mentor for the rest of your life. And perhaps you can have a connection and they will advise you on a lot of things. So a mentor for life, huh? And, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure they will agree, you know. Uh, so you have a mentee from Assam, so who do you choose out of the four? It's like a shark tank, just the Assam version. Okay, shark tank. I think I'll go for Abhinandita ma'am. Okay. So Abhinandita ma'am, I'm going to give you the mic. She just told us that she wants, she's an aspiring civil servant. She, want to, she wants to be a civil servant. Now, I want you to go back to your life when you were in college, sitting in a conference like this. What were you thinking about of being, did you have career goals? I'm good, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, sorry, can I know your name? My name is Himparna Das. Himparna? Himparna, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what I was thinking about in college, that's a while ago, and I will uh, leave that aside for now. But um, I'm not a civil servant, um, I'm a political person, and I think that what we have in common is actually public service. Right, and we all want to bring it in. No matter what you do, if you're an artist or a journalist or, you know, a social worker or even a doctor, right? It is the same compassion or sensibility or your politics with which you work. I think that um, if you stay to value, then um, you're in a good place, and opportunities will keep finding you, and roles will change as you go along. Thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was wonderful. Okay, I want one more volunteer. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come, come ahead. Okay, the third one, get ready. Huh? Who's going to be the third one? So we need four now. Yeah, go on. Hi. Afternoon to all. Thank you for having me. Okay, so... If I say what my dream no, what, is... Introduce yourself, no? what are okay, you doing? We don't yeah. know, so yeah. <laughs> I am Sneha Shen from B. Burwa College, uh, pursuing BSc Stats major. Okay, so I want to do MBA. And then I also want to support women and stand for them. Women who don't have voice. Voice, kind of, they can't stand for themselves. Though I don't uh, want them to be dependent on me, but to push them to the extent they can stand for themselves. And like any kind of crime against women or any humanity, I want to stop that in whatever way I can. Thank you. So who do you choose? I think crimes against women would be more towards uh, Ma'am Lalita. That's, that's her. Yeah? yeah, yeah sure. Hi, hello everybody. I'm very happy to be here. It's a lovely state and uh, I have always loved coming to Assam. I had a Bengali mother, so I, have, I, I always feel I have a common thread between people in Assam and myself. Now, I'm very impressed by what you said about wanting to help other women who don't have a voice. Because I've spent the larger part of my life trying to do that. As he said, I don't normally stick to a mold. I'm notorious for being too frank, too blunt, too unwomanly. As you know, your earlier, the, the lady, the IS officer said, uh, more often than not, I'm told that you're more like a man, like a woman. 
than a woman. When I was young, I used to get very upset, but as I grew older, I, I used to say, oh, never mind, I don't care, I'm me. So, um, but most women in this country don't have a voice, even today. Um, she's from the same college where I studied. I was in the first batch of girls. It's a very well-known college. But, uh, you know, we were, we were 41 girls and some 3,000 boys. So in our first year, I, I always tell people that we used to be treated like cockroaches, you know, get out of the way, they, they tell us in the, in the huge halls and stuff. But you learn to survive. And once you have done that, you realize how much women need to be told that you can do it. Just stick together, have a certain amount of empathy for each other. Don't always criticize other women. Um, you know, I, it took a long time for, for me to realize that it's not just men who are patriarchal. More women are patriarchal than men because they have grown up thinking that that is their power to allow men to have control over them. And this is one of the first lessons that I teach everybody I come across. That if women can stick together, believe me, when men don't stand a chance. You know, even, uh, for example, take the example of the corona epidemic. It is the women who carried the brunt of everything. The people who were sick, uh, the women who stopped working, who didn't get full salaries or even part salaries, who took the beatings and the, you know, everything from within the household, managed their children. And it was almost double the burden that working women face when you're actually going to work. Because then you had income coming in, you had some sort of independence. And uh, every family is lost without its women. Every family. I say this very openly nowadays. 40 years ago when I started work, I couldn't say it so openly. But today, people understand. What will you do if your grandmother or your mother or your aunt or your sister or your wife or your daughter, whoever it is, it's not there. They're all just nobody's there in the house. There are no women. You think the men can ever manage? They can't. Ulta, the women will somehow manage, even if the man is there or not. So we need to first start believing in ourselves. If we believe that we can do it, we can and we will do it. So this is the first lesson I say you tell other women. Regardless, you may not like her politics, you may not agree with the way she dresses, whatever, it doesn't matter. The first thing to understand is that we can stand together, really nobody holds a chance before us. I don't mean anything against any of the men in this audience or anywhere outside. But women have to learn to first respect themselves. If you have that respect or self-respect, automatically, like she said to the earlier girl, things will come your way. Everything takes a little time. Sometimes you think, what is this? Everything is going wrong. But it will fall in place. A little patience, a little self-belief, and you know the, the 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 commitment to yourself first, and that's it. Things will fall in line. So um, I'm very impressed by your desire to want to help women without a voice, and the best thing to do to give them a voice is to give them that um, belief in themselves. Okay, thanks. So if all of them band together, I'll be like Mr. McAdams. I don't know how many of you know about Mr. McAdams. I'll just be saying, dear host, you know, I haven't spoken. That's what happens when all of them get together and start speaking. I'll be the McAdams uh, of this conference. Thank you, Thank you so much for uh, sharing. Uh, can I have... Can I share something? Two more? Can I share something? Is it very long? No, okay. it will be a short one. Yeah. As I stay here, like I'm not from here, I'm from Bangaregao. So I stay here in a uh, rented room, one BHK. So every other day, uh, whoever comes in uh, to look uh, the room by my side, they are like, you stay here alone. The other day also, uh, there was a man asking me, you stay here alone. The expression was, in a whole room, you stay there alone. I said, yeah, in a whole room, I stay there alone. That expression comes from both men and women but it comes from women more and I used to be upset a little bit but then I said yeah I do it by my own yeah I do everything by my own and it's uh, it's giving me some kind of confidence I'm so jealous <laughs> I was sharing one room with four boys in Bangalore it was terrible so I'm jealous of you so can I have one Thank more you. Volunteer, yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pujashri Mahanta. 
I am a Hindu college graduate in botany, and then I have done my master's from Terry University. And uh, currently, I am the social media conductor of uh, Bharatiya Janata Yuva Morcha, Guwahati City District. And uh, like, I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, event. And uh, what I want to be in life is, I like, I really like writing. Is there a problem? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry. So, um, like, someday in my life, I want to be a writer. As a person, I'm quite opinionated. So, I think, uh, because I am, like, we are four daughters to my parents. And when I was born, my grandmother didn't come to see me because I was again a girl. So, it was always, like, it was in me that I always had to give my opinions in things. So, that way, I became very much opinionated. And... That's why I started writing. I started writing strong articles as well. Recently, I have been publishing few of my articles in some local dailies. And um, if not a writer, then I would want to become a businesswoman someday. Because obviously, everyone likes money and everyone likes power. <laughs> and so, yeah, I would just go ahead and give that a shot. So I'm very happy to see all of you today, and it's so inspiring to come up and speak here. Thank you. No, choose a mentor. No, no. Uh, we got two left. <laughs> this is such a tough decision because I don't like doing such things, but... No, you <laughs> have to. You have to assert your leadership now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then I would choose uh, Lalita, ma'am, because, yeah, for... Who? Lalita, ma'am. She's already been selected by our girl from Bongai Gaon, no? She's already gone to Bongai Gaon. Then Soumya, ma'am. Okay. So. If, if you want to be a businesswoman, right person. <laughs> Bangalore is the city of opportunity. So yeah. you'll get all your trade license and all, you know, you can go to her for help. <laughs> Obviously, I'll go someday and ask for ma'am's help. <laughs> sure. Um, I really want to, um, you know, congratulate you because at such a young age, you actually, um, you know, figured out what you're passionate about. Yes. You know, you said writing and then I also want to, uh, you know, um, become, um, you know, make money and get into business and stuff for that. And it's just so important. Earlier, the speakers were actually talking about glass ceiling and it's actually just so true. And uh, in fact, I was recollecting, <clears throat> you know, my childhood as well. Uh, I also, uh, I mean, in my, at my home, never, obviously my parents never felt that, oh, she's a girl and my, when my brother was born. But I still very vividly remember as soon as my brother was born, all the attention went to him. Yeah. And then I was like, oh my God. And it was actually people outside. And then, actually, when I actually think about it, it's things that have actually happened after that. When I came out of my house, it's that's when I realized the amount of patriarchy and everything, and also, you know, the amount of uh, injustice that's out there. And I think uh, talking about business and also about writing, I think it's a very, especially right now, back when yeah. we were studying, it was either engineering or medicine. Yeah. <laughs> and now there are so many different opportunities, like you said, I mean, first of all, you've, you know, taken on um, social media and everything, and that's actually brilliant right now. But <clears throat> I think if you really want to talk about business, so pick, a, pick something that you're passionate about. And whatever, I used to also run a business earlier. I used to run a restaurant and an activist center before I became an elected representative. And uh, and yes, it it was uh, it was just amazing. I think the more, I think the the best advice that I can give you is find whatever you are passionate about. I remember at one point of time, you know, uh, I mean, we have we have no experience in hospitality whatsoever. I just like took it on, and I remember people had suddenly quit, and there were just like three people running the entire restaurant, and I was washing dishes till like one in the morning. But then I'm so, but I was so proud of what I did. And I think that's what, the, that's what's so important. Make, f figure out what is it that you're passionate about. 
so it, it's not going to feel like you know oh my god it's it's work and money will automatically you know come once you know you figure out what you're passionate about and then in time you know that you're going to be good at it good luck thank you okay one more volunteer this is so good yeah i love that you all are coming forward like this it's so nice hello hello and good afternoon everyone myself gyanushree coach i am currently pursuing my masters uh, from tata institute of social sciences guwahati campus in ecology environment and sustainable development so we all know that environment is such a sensitive issue for the people of northeast so i w i want to myself to be the voice for environment for mostly for the northeast area so i would like you to uh, to mentor me for being the voice mainly the environment and take it to uh, a different level and a global level so that it becomes a matter of uh, discussion among everyone because it's the most sensitive issue to be talked right now and it is given the least importance i think so one mentor is left yeah i would like to choose angelica ma'am hey hi thank you so much um environment is of course um, climate change is one of the uh, issues that we're facing right now and when we talk about climate change what we tend to forget is the impact of climate change is borne by women much more it, there is a gendered impact of climate change for example uh, if we look at villages it is women who often go to far away places to fetch water but well, due to climate change they have to you know drying up or ponds etc therein they have to walk much more longer or collecting firewood for example so we often tend to ignore the gender impact and i think the focus for us to be un to understand that it affects women much more than men uh, any kind of disaster be it um, earthquake be it um, you know, floods assam has regularly has a lot of floods or be it the con pandemic for covid pandemic you know it has any kind of disaster always impacts women much more than men and that is why we need much much more women at the decision making table to ensure that they understand the impact that women are going through right and uh, this is why we are sort of fighting for more women to have that seat at the table i'm glad that you're passionate about climate change i hope that someday you'll be there sitting at the table and making decisions for the people who are being impacted by climate change which is us all but even more so in rural areas because we need to understand intersectionality we need to understand that the the, the intersection of for example being a being a woman born in a lower caste family or an economically low family the what they face is much more than a woman who's born in an upper class family or a, 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 a rich family right so we need to understand that intersectionality and we need to work much more for those people who are much more impacted the more marginalized group and i hope to see you there to uh, come day and i will be happy to mentor you karma has left me with no choice but even more so i will be delighted to do it thank you thank you ma'am uh, i just want to add something to you that is that you know uh, while the admission we have started to admit that women are at the center of everything we don't equip them to um, we know their problems we talk to them saying give us your opinion but we don't include them in two things one the decision making and two we don't skill them we don't teach them how to get across those problems now angelica was talking about how women are unfairly or more than proportionately affected by climate change um eventually there will be tap water in all the houses but the problem is we don't teach women once tap water reaches their house not to waste water and you know it is the mother who teaches children everything everything how to wash your hands once you've had your food once you washed your ass sorry uh, you know everything it's the women who do the teaching but we don't skill women we need to pay specific attention to the upskilling of women especially like angelica said those who are less educated and less uh, fortunate than perhaps they haven't had the opportunities we've had because it's a intergenerational thing that goes if you have a mother who is not yet who is not very well educated and you don't live in a city you live in a smaller town or a village children tend to not have the skills that they need to get ahead in life very very few you will see uh, 
who have to be absolutely brilliant, I mean, you know, remarkable in some way or the other, can get out of it and come out. There are stories, but they're too few and too far between. So uh, address any solutions you find to the women specifically. You get their inputs and address them because they are the ones who will ultimately take the family also forward. Hmm? Thank you, ma'am. I just want to add something as well. Awesome. I just saw uh, myself, you know, uh, a decade, a decade and a half ago. I also uh, started off as an animal rights and an environmental activist in college. And I think it's just so important. And that's exactly why I got into electoral politics. It's because we need people sitting in those chairs to have that political will to do things. And especially for the environment. Keep yeah. going. Thank you, ma'am. So co-mentor, it's allowed. <laughs> huh? So after this, you need to take their numbers, email IDs and all, and stay in touch. Huh? It's a promise yes. that you need to make yourself and you'll be guided forever. So I got like two, three sheets of paper here. Uh, we got some time left where I ask them the questions. I think I want to ask them questions. I've been wanting because I've been planning to ask them. So I have, again, I need your help because we are not on Zoom and I can hear you and you all can talk at once in Zoom. You can't talk at once. So there are two sets of questions I have. One is, uh, we talk about policy, politics, you know, and all those things. The other set of questions is ab about more about their personal life, the personal struggles, you know. So I will say one, which is for policy, government. It's very important, but sometimes very boring and it's very hot. The second thing, a little exciting about their life, about their struggles and all. So I'll say one, you give me the shout. I'll say two, you give me a shout. So between the... Uh, the intensity of the sound that we will choose which set to go by one one two that's not loud enough I thought one was louder let me hear again two okay that behind guys are not in yeah okay so so we'll start with personal journeys. And I, and I want to start with Angelica, uh, you know, uh, because she's had a very interesting journey uh, from the time she went to Delhi. She spoke very passionately earlier about how at 12 uh, she faced racial abuse and not just racial abuse, sexual abuse in the middle of the road where she thought as a student she was safe. Your journey into politics and why you? Why did you quit for now? Okay, maybe I'll have to repeat my speech all over again, Karma. Not really. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, but thank you for asking me that question. Um, earlier, uh, as Karma was mentioning, I am. Um, some of you were not here. Just to recap a little bit of that, I moved to Delhi when I was twelve, and uh, as a teacher, um, I come from Manipur, and. Um, my classmates, I'm kind of emotional after what is spoke, so I'm just trying to control my tears. But yeah, uh, my classmates were always used to kind of, you know, call me chinky, Chinese and whatnot. It's very normal. But coming from Manipur, landing in a big city, I had hopes and dreams, but r racism was the reality there. So, but one day this incident was when I was walking down the street, out of nowhere, it was really hot, day, as hotter than today. And this man comes up to me out of nowhere, I was 12 years old, he extends his hand drops at my barely existing breast. He looks at me and gives me a creepy smile and calls me chinky and walks away. I just stood there numb and frozen. But that was when I look back, you know, when I came back and told my sister about that incident and she, she told me this is what happens to us in this city. I tried to bury it. I tried to forget about it. We are often told to forget about it, right? I tried to forget about it, but I just couldn't. I, it became that moment for me which changed my life drastically. I decided to do something about it. I got involved into activism. At the age of 20, I joined politics. I decided to do something about it. And uh, when I joined politics, I was elected in Delhi University. Then I was in the national, uh, uh, in the national body of uh, students' body of a political party. <laughs> and uh, I just, but. When I joined the political party, I come from no political background. I'm a first generation politician. And uh, again, I come from the North East. It's the political system. There is sexism. There is patriarchy so much. There is also racism. 
I would often walk into rooms and male, senior male politicians will look at me, will try to shake my hand, and the hand will press in harder, and they'll make comments like, North Eastern women are so progressive. That's a subtle hint that I will be available for them, right? This were incidents that will happen. Sometimes it will be a friendly hug. And I know that in politics, friendly hugs are not so normal, but they would come to me with a friendly hug and press me hard and saying that, you are, you're a cute little girl, not a son girls are very smart, and you know, those kinds of insinuations would always continue. India does not have a pol uh, any organization that con actively works for political parties, right, at that point in time. Now we do, I run this organization. But at that point in time, I didn't have any woman mentor, I didn't know anyone who could, I could go and cry to. Uh, I faced this for a while, but I really worked hard, I struggled, I did my best. In fact, uh, I also was preparing for an uh, Vidhan Sabha seat. I was working on the land, I was working on a year, I was working on a year, I was working on a year, I tried to work really hard. At the day the ticket was announced, I got to know that my ticket was cut. I didn't get the ticket. Interesting enough, when the announcement came out, I was very depressed, I was crying, you know, I was so hard working, I didn't get the ticket. After a little while, I was like, I have tweet notifications that I have been named as one of Forbes India 30 under 30 for my work in policy and politics. Look at the irony of that. My political party, for whom I've worked so hard, sidelined me completely. And then there's this organization which is recognizing my work in policy and politics. That was the day I decided that I cannot keep continuing this. I need to do something about women. I need to do something about women in politics specifically. And that is how I left India for a while and that's how this organization came about. But the point here is women in politics face so much of harassment, face so much of sexism, not just from the voters, but from our, within our own political parties as well. And this is not just about one political party or two political parties, this is about most political parties. And I hope I have answered your question. A round of applause for her. Uh, I just want to know when you are going to get back to politics, uh, yeah, so that uh, we'll be clear, you know, when or we all have to be ready to support her. Um, in the next five years or so, um, my larger aim is to have this organization. We have been ten training and mentoring women in politics. Uh, we do fellowship programs, etc. Uh, but I want it to run for five years where I control everything and make sure that everything is institutionalized so that it can be independent of me. And after five years, I'm going to go back to electoral politics. So you're going to lose five years of this wonderful politician, uh, but all the best with what you're yeah. doing right now. Uh, I'm very scared to ask the next question, but I have to ask it. So, Larita, you come from a political family, isn't it? Uh, you know, your grandfather was a chief minister. Uh, your father was a leftist ideologue. You know, fantastic family. Um, was it difficult for you as well? to make a mark, to stand today where you are, to be the chairperson of the National Women's Commission? Um, I come from a very political family, very leftist, almost all of them. Very, very leftist. I mean, my mother uh, was from Bengal. Most people don't know her political background, but uh, again, extremely leftist. Uh, her aunt, Geeta Mukherjee, is even today known as one of the most aggressive uh, uh, CPI MPs that West Bengal ever had. Um, I came into politics at a very late age. I'm not uh, uh, from a very young age. I was uh, about 40 by the time I came into politics. It was a very reluctant entry. And even while being in politics, I, you know, by 40, your opinions are made. Your character is already made. It's difficult to change at that age. And uh, I had faced patriarchy all my life because I was the third child, the second daughter. Um, and uh, I was always very outspoken and very opinionated. Um, I was an extraordinarily good student, so I managed to get away with both the outspokenness and the opin opinion of opinions. Otherwise, I'd have really been in, you know, in the dog's house. Um, and um, I was very fortunate to have had an, a brilliant and absolutely wonderful education that was given to me. Um, so in a sense, I didn't face patriarchy in the sense that I was never held back for being a girl. 
But yes, uh, all the usual expectations that you must get married, that you must have children, all this blah, blah, you must be a very good cook, all of that. It puts an enormous amount of pressure on an individual. I had not so much nowadays, but uh, till about 10 years ago, I had this compulsion to do, to be the best at everything I do. It puts an enormous amount of pressure on one person. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid that most women have to go through this. I used to think I'm the only one, but then more and more as I, I started taking a back seat and relaxing, you know, not being too bothered by what other people say about me, including people in my own party, unfortunately. Because uh, as uh, she said, uh, politics is an extraordinarily patriarchal uh, field. And again, it's regardless of what party you may be in. Um, men will make nasty remarks about you, so will women. You have, to, uh, you have to develop a very thick skin. Um, she joined into an organization which was actually set up by my brother when he was very young. He was the founder president of the National Students Union of India. And I know, I mean, I, as a very young child, I have seen him and another very famous youth congress leader, Priyaranjan Das Munshi, because uh, they used to get along very well because all of us in my family speak Bengali because of the Bengali mother. So I have been privy to conversations where, um, you know, they would actively say that, no, no, I mean, that's a girl. In Bengali, they say, to me ki korbe. That is, after all, she's a girl. What is she going to be able to do? You know, will she be able to work in the field? That sort of thing. So I used to get extremely angry. That, what the hell, man? I go to school. I go to college and school by bus, like every other student. Why can't women do this? And um, um, uh, so politics for me was not really a natural place to go to. And I have, I think I've often made waves for the wrong reasons. Uh, but like I said, I was not really very willing to change the person I am. And um, eventually, yes, there was a level of acceptance. But I have worked with women for 40 years, long before I came into politics, 20 years before I came into politics. And in the south of India, levels of education are much, much higher than in most other parts of the country. So education gives you an edge. And that is something that I've always tried to pass on. Education also gives you an experience that helps you to uh, face your uh, whatever patriarchy, whatever problems you may face, financial, uh, social, cultural, and of course, familial uh, uh, problems. Luckily, my family always supported me. But yeah, um, I have realized that politics is not a panacea. It's not the answer to everything. Uh, because the level of commitment amongst politicians can sometimes be very shallow. Uh, and I'm, again, this is nothing to do with just India. I have met politicians from all over the world. And today, most politics is not like what it was 40, 50, 60 years ago. There is an ag it's agenda driven today. In my father's time and my grandfather's time, they were more idealistic. Today, those ideals are a lot there. So I'm very cynical about politics today. I uh, actually agreed to come to this thing because I, it was about governance. And governance is not just politicians. Governance is a lot more about, and if it is about politics, it's about the lower level, the panchayat level, which luckily in this country, due to the, the good decision that Rajiv Gandhi took, I mean, he's not from my party a leader, but nonetheless, one should give credit where it's due. And we have reservation at the panchayat level. Uh, today, after 27 years of that bill being passed, you have a lot of young women sitting on this, you know, on this dais. And that is what I have always wanted to see. So if, uh, when I was head of NCW, I mean, I got too involved in it because I, uh, I put my heart and soul into that job because that's what I had done for years. So that was, for me, not a political job at all. It became more than political. And I ruffled a lot of feathers across the board in lots of parties. But it is a job that uh, gave me an opportunity to actually think of, you know, what could be done to help women in the future. And most of what uh, it, women who have not made it or don't have the opportunities is because of the lack of facilitation from society as a whole. Whether it's politicians, whether it's bureaucrats, whether it's the police. And that is something that uh, I have, uh, after my stint as NCW chairperson, towards the end of it, I was in treatment for breast cancer. So, I, I mean, that also gave me the experience of learning how 
one needs to look after one's own health we don't pay attention to our own health ever i mean hardly ever we're so busy looking after everybody else friends colleagues family everybody that we really don't pay attention to ourselves so i really st took a step back from active everyday politics and decided that the time has come where i really must learn to share what i have learned with other women because we don't do that we don't talk to each other and women of my age really don't talk to the younger generation as equals we we talk down to you which is not fair it's not it's absolutely unfair because every woman has to go through her own experience every individual every human being does and women are in a very unique place to be able to share what we have with other women if you are on an equal footing if i talk down to somebody whom you know for example karma said bent or her she's going to switch off and i don't blame her for it because i must learn to listen before i can mentor others and this is something that we don't do in our society one of the biggest things about patriarchy is women are not listened to once you made it by which time you don't need anybody's mentorship everybody is keen to listen to you but when you are on the way up you're climbing those steps your voice is not really ever heard and this is something that i i'd advise every woman here that listen to other women it's only then you can help them you know to really make it to the top everybody needs a helping hand regardless even i'm sure the great indra han gandhi must have i mean any big name you want to call in and you they need somebody who's been there for them if we can be there for other women i think that's the best thing any of us can do and in my life i have learned that because i have had my mother my aunt i've had mentors who have in many ways given me the strength to overcome and that's a very i've been a very very lucky woman and maybe that's why even though i got into politics at such a late age i made a mark up to an extent i'm not saying i you know i've compared to many other women i haven't made to the biggest posts and stuff but i'm happy that i've been able to contribute and in the end that's very important thank you that was so nice listen to each other how many of you all listen don't listen to each other listen to each other <laughs> uh somi i want to pass the mic to you uh with a question uh, while you were uh, sharing earlier you said that you spent time running a restaurant yeah uh uh you spent time washing this dishes yourself uh to being i think when you were elected you were the only woman mla to win in bangalore i mean which is such a huge statement for a metropolitan city like like bangalore you know and they're already playing the drums for you so yeah a congratulation again and let us hear your story I think I let the drums finish. You might have to rap no, with it. I'm so, so, I'm kidding, so this I'm is going to go you need to rap with it. No, I'm just kidding. We will go viral in Assam and Northeast. <laughs> rap your story to the Ha, huh, can we get them to practice a little later? So, um I mean it was um, I mean I frankly um I mean, I actually have to. I was just thinking, you know, listening to, um, you know, both of you, um, and I and I was, there is um, assembly session going on in uh, my state, but I was so looking forward um, to coming here and being a part of this, you know, wonderful event. Is because of this. you know is because of this we know i don't get to do this very often every day actually come and listen to are you are you guys able to listen oh, it's fine okay <clears throat> so yeah um when you know uh, mom was actually talking about supporting other women and i think it's just just so important sisterhood and supporting each other and i was actually looking forward to that to actually come here and actually you know get inspired and you know um reflect as well so um go back to my story yeah i mean uh, i um kind of uh, i mean yes i come from a political family as well my dad is a um mla seven time mla my grandpa was a corporator as well but uh, but it was like right from um but i used to actually hate politics and politicians 
from childhood. But I think somewhere in the back of my mind, it was there. But I grew up as an extreme like activist. I started off with animal rights um, in school, and then environmental rights, and then um, women's rights, LGBT rights, women's um, human rights. And in fact, there is um, I, I, there are there are many instances where my father is inaugurating, and I'm protesting outside. I, yeah, it's a long story. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> that he was inaugurating. And then <laughs> it was a PETA protest. And this was about the poultry industry. My dad was a Bangalore development minister. And I'm like, that voice sounds familiar. <laughs> and then <laughs> everyone looks at me. I'm like, oh. And then immediately, as soon as the event get, gets over, my dad's like, calls my mom. He's like, you know who's protesting outside today? And then I call up. I used to be this extremely, you know, militant animal rights activist, you know, uh, when I was younger. I was like, oh my god, mom, you know, who was like inaugurating this? He knows how cruel, you know, there's so much of cruelty in the poultry industry, blah, 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 blah. blah. And then, um, so, but then, uh, so that evening, I'm sitting, having dinner, dad walks in we both look at each other and we burst out laughing that's how my life has been right from childhood i i organized my first protest when i was in uh, i think first year of college i was 18 i went i'm like dad i'm organizing this protest blah 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 and he's like oh will you be in media i'm like i don't know maybe He's like, uh, no. My dad always says no to, no to everything, even now. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm going to do this. If you want to, if you want to support good, if not, deal with it. <laughs> so, that's, so that's how my life started as an activist. But then over the next couple of years, uh, I mean, I feel extremely, in retrospect, uh, thankful for my parents were putting up with me <laughs> because um, I mean I would I remember this every protest suddenly in the corner of the I would get a missed call and I would get on the corner of the street my dad would like be in his car just come and like wave in solidarity almost every protest and uh, in fact I have taken I've, I've fought Supreme Court cases as well when against my own government but not a single time my dad ever said, you know, don't do this. He always respected what I did. He's like, she's doing her job, I'm doing mine. I very vividly remember a couple of years ago, this was uh, just after I got my uh, ticket um, for the assembly elections. This was, I think, in 2018 early. Um, <clears throat> and um, so we went and met the then CM. Mr. Sidramaya, and we had a discussion, something, I think it was about veganism, something, and then he asked something, I said something, I just kept quiet. And uh, we came out and he's like, why did you keep quiet? You usually don't let anyone go. You argue and argue and argue because that's how you are and until you convince them. I said, I don't know that, he's just, he's a chief minister and he's just given me the ticket and I don't want to like piss him off. He's like, listen, he said this very seriously. He's like, listen, be the chief minister or be the prime minister. Do not ever, ever lose who you are. Do not ever stop standing up for what you believe in. And that is so important. And I think, um, and that's how, of course, I mean, um, long story short, almost about 15, 20 years, um, I was an activist. Um, I worked predominantly in the nonprofit sector as well. And then, uh, like I said earlier, I used to like hate politics, hate politicians. And then I realized, um, I very vividly remember we had drafted this very brilliant uh, bill. This was about the en uh, environmental impact in poultry sector. And uh, it went and sat on this desk of a uh, special secretary. And then I realized that it's either going to go to the dustbin or it's going to collect dust. 
because months passed by, it was six months, a year. And then I realized that people sitting in those chairs, be it elected representatives or be it bureaucrats, if they don't have the political will to do things, they go on criticizing. But it is, and that's exactly when I decided to jump into this uh, cesspool, if you want to call it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm kidding. So into this, uh, into electoral politics. And uh, so yeah, that's how my whole journey began as an elected representative. So when do you think uh, Karnataka will have a woman chief minister? How many years will it take? Hopefully. Is there a realistic time frame? Can we say like the next three years, five years? No, I think it's about time. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think women, uh, we are, um, we have, I mean, breaking all glass ceilings and we are going to break that glass ceiling very soon as well. All the best. I mean, Anjita, I would like to get you in on your party and how you started your political journey because, you know, your journey has been uh, with a fairly new, open, uh, you know, with a new mindset kind of a party, although uh, many would might disagree to the mold that they have gotten into today, but still, you know, fresh new party. Was it difficult for you to break into the roles that you have been assigned to? Uh, I'll be really honest, uh, not at all actually. It has not been difficult at all. Um, I am from Delhi, uh, from old Delhi, my ancestors are from Delhi and you know, by the time I was 30, I was done with Delhi and I wanted to leave, so I had moved to uh, Goa with my family and lived there six years doing more research and quiet work. Um, and then I saw a flash mob in uh, on YouTube on uh, from Delhi, where I saw a lot of young people, boys and girls, um, you know, for dancing to Patsal Kejriwal. And I was like, okay, what is happening here? Because clearly a city that I had given up on, uh, goodness had become cool again in that city. And you know, then I quit my job, etc., and started working with uh, Amadni Party in Goa. And then subsequently in 2017, I was moving to Delhi. Uh, I teach at Ambedkar University. And uh, Mr. Sisodia was looking for an advisor. And so anyway, so, so far it has just been a non-issue, uh, to be honest, uh, because it is a new party. It is like a startup. There is little time for certain dynamics in the sense everybody is in a rush to work. So there are a lot of women in the party. Some you will see here on platforms like this. Many you will not. But there is a lot of hardcore work that uh, your data related work, whether it is prachar or whether it is going on television and so on. So at the moment, we are definitely in that mode. Uh, where we have a lot of women involved in different capacities uh, that are not necessarily traditionally associated with women in politics. And it is therefore that we have a bottom-up approach in terms of policy, which is why you know our focus is on education, our focus is on health, our focus is on um, various schemes like electricity and water, which are of which women are the most important and most, uh, you know, they're the direct beneficiaries of all that. So in that sense, it is not difficult. Um, what is difficult sometimes is uh, mind your tongue uh, or, you know, be, be palatable, etc. Which you would be even as a, you know, if you were a researcher and you would go to a social context, you would adjust to that. But in the party, I think it's, um, we're in a good place like that. And we have enough policies to prove. In fact, in one of your interviews, you had talked about a, a, a gender-responsive government. And you'd said how giving free uh, bus passes to women is one of the examples of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, anybody who has studied social mobility, economic mobility for women, or not even studied, but it's basic, right? So one of the problems, and I think the men on this panel would agree that despite all our privileges, for women in politics, one place where we don't get tickets or we don't get is because we don't have enough financial backing at times. And that is true for you know all the women in all uh, fields. So if there is a, it is so common, like access to technology, for example, if there is a mobile phone, so the old one will go to the sister 
or the old one will go to the mother. Similarly, if you know one person has to study, uh, the son will go to the private school and the daughter will go to the government school, which is why then our focus comes to government schools. And that is, a, that is how you enable uh, anybody who is marginalized or is left behind. So the bus, uh, uh, bus free bus ticket policy is actually remarkable because women end up saving. Uh, obviously, the bus is going to bus, there is a need for money in the day. And if you save 1,000, 2,000 rupees, you will be able to save it on your own study, you will be able to course, you will be able to learn yoga or whatever. So then, you know, that access of, or that luxury, of spending money on what you want to spend on. That is what, that is how it enables, plus jobs. Sometimes, you know, let's say for example, last point here, that let's say if I get an internship, and it's an unpaid internship, right? And if I'm a girl and the family has limited means, there is a chance ki, wo boling ki, ghar ke log boling ki, yaar, paise to kuch mil nahi rahe, kya seekhna hai jake, aur ulta kharcha karwaegi. But, wo chota sa, sa rupay, hazaar rupay, paanch sa rupay, बहुत दूर तक जाता है for a lot of women so in that sense absolutely we are very focused on women centric work thank you I'll just open it up for questions now if you have any uh, just introduce yourself anyone any other question you are the panelist I am the moderator no? so I get to say <laughs> can I say I something yeah yeah okay. you know after hearing um, everybody what <laughs> What we must uh, also uh, talk about is, one is, of course, women need to be in places of, uh, in positions of decision making. And eventually, why this dialogue is important is also that, you know, eventually we'll also get to do things our own way, in the sense that there is a certain sensibility, there is a certain vulnerability that we are, you know, okay to expose which in a male-dominated political scenario one is not able to. Or like Nan said, that you know, she's, and it is true that she's very generous in sharing her experiences with other women. I find that, you know, when in doubt, just listen to a woman who has achieved something, um, not necessarily in this sense, or your mother or your grandmother or whatever, and that is a, that is a, uh, you know, always a source of, strength and especially for uh, you know aspiring women politicians I think women, other women are a great source of um, strength because we are constantly negotiating you know right from childhood so um, so I think how we do things will also uh, become more fun and uh, when more women are in positions so one last question uh, from me Working in, uh, uh, you know, outside in CNN, CNBC, for me, because I was the odd man out, uh, going out with a funny face, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it was difficult because I was fighting, say, maybe like the Bengali lobby and there was this little Malayali lobby and there was this different lobbies in the newsroom, right? And you stand out and you're not part of the lobby. So what you do is you try to excel. You try to be the best at whatever you do and you try to be there all the time. So I would almost spend 24 hours. And Angelica's story is the same uh, because there was no way out. She's the first generation politician. So even she tried to excel. But how do we handle patriarchy in your workplace, wherever you do, how do you succeed? Uh, what do you do? So quick advices from everybody. I think with age, I have realized that uh, you're still is... young. What are you talking about? You're so I... young. What do no, you mean back... age? Back when I was younger, I always used to you're feel. Still young. <laughs> you okay, but I used to feel that you know I'm a tomboy, and you know I used to feel that um, my male friendships were important than my female friendships. But with age, I have realized that there is nothing stronger in the world than female friendships. No one will ever hold you up like other women will hold you up. In my experience, it has only been when, I mean, uh, except for maybe one or two men who will help you out without expecting anything in return. But it is only women who will go out of their way and lift you up. So always remember that strong women uplift each other. 
I think I have already unburdened myself enough. But uh, um, well, one of the most important lessons that I have learned is not just what she said, but that uh, patriarchy can be fought at many levels. Sometimes you just it's best just to ignore it. I mean, people will go on saying something. People will try to pull you down. Ignore the thing. Just let them say what they want. Who cares? Uh, my mother used to say that as you get older, you perfect the art of not listening to something you don't want to listen to. And I agreed with her. When I was younger, you're much more sensitive. You react to everything in a very. Uh, you take everything very personally. Don't, because many times uh, many people say something just for effect, because they want to be the last. I mean, the person saying the last. Have they want to have the last word? Ignore it. Not worth it. Uh, regardless of whether they are men or women, and that's another thing I learned as I grew older that it's not just men who are patriarchal. Women are extremely patriarchal. And when they want to put another woman down, that's what they use. The old, you know, uh, ghisa pita, as we say in Hindu, uh, Hindi, the old ghisa pita methods of putting a woman down. She's too dark, she's too fat, she's too thin, she's too young, she's flirt, she's whatever, whatever, all the bullshit that we hear. Sorry. Uh, all, all this nonsense that we hear. If you feel something, uh, you know, if somebody is trying to in any way bring you down, ignore it. It goes away after some time. You will forget about it. Don't let it affect you personally. Don't take it personally. Politics is a very, very rough field. Not just for women, for men also, but more so for women. And we get very emotional. You have to learn to leave emotion outside the door when you're in politics. Agreed? Otherwise, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, I mean, but you know, uh, it's often used against you. What they will say is that, you know, ye to roti hai. I mean, you know, she gets emotional for everything. She's not clear-headed. And it's very unfair. Because I have seen men lose their temper. And they, they hold grudges much more than women. Women are much more forgiving. So um, let me, I mean, I, I had a brother who was a very, very famous politician. Everybody adored him. And uh, I loved him very much. He was my elder brother. But I knew what a rascal he could be also, especially to me, you know. And uh, every time I say that, and he was a very famous, very, very popular politician. He died suddenly at the age of 48 of blood cancer. And I remember how many people came up to me. I never knew anybody. Had, I mean, I didn't know them at all. And uh, I used to say, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, he was great. But believe me, he was an elder brother. So I know what a bully he was to me. No, but then one day, you know, my, my aunt said, shut up, nobody's going to believe it. Let them say what they want, who cares? At that point, I realized, said, yeah, who cares? Let them say what they want. So this is a lesson that, you know, um, it really helps. It may sound very facile, but uh, it really helps. We get too affected by what people say and think about us. Don't bother too much. If, you're, if you know that you want something, you're doing it the right way, forget about what other people say. I, I'm just like wondering, um, I'm just thinking not to repeat myself, I mean, what Mama said. So to just add a little bit more, um, I think having a thick skin is just like so important. I think it's not just in uh, governance or in, uh, you know, politics, but I think generally as well, it's like, um, I mean, <clears throat> earlier I used to get extremely disturbed when I used to uh, when I used to get you know attacked, trolled, and everything. But it's actually but now if I don't get trolled once in a month, I'm like, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> so I think it's I see at the end of the day, it's a patriarchal world. Have a, have a system around you. For me, it's my immediate family and uh, you know they they help me they ground me like how ma'am was saying my brother is my biggest critique and of course my mom and dad of course and i think um, and i think it's it's not just i think politics any woman i think any profession it takes they say it takes a village and i think it's so true just to in fact like you know go out and work and i think it's over here yes it's it's the same as well 
I think the biggest thing is believe in yourself and uh, have you know people around you who will support you and I think yes I think they say oh I think it's because it's just so patriarchal they say oh women are this women are that women are emotional I think I think that's what makes us unique I think we need to celebrate that and um, and especially <clears throat> earlier I used to be um, I think the biggest mistake that most of us, especially women, do are uh, we are not nice. Not you know, it's not others. It's not we are not nice to ourselves. We are our biggest critiques, and I think we go on playing that you know this voice in the head. I think we need to start acknowledging ourselves. I think more often for all the struggles that we have, you know. Um, based and uh, everything that we have achieved in life and I think it's just so important to actually celebrate that. I think we're also over apologetic sometimes where we also try to overly compensate and by being very nice and I think it's just only with women and I think it's because we think that we don't belong. It's because you know we're like oh my god oh it's because it's somewhere that okay once you start believing in, in yourself and start acknowledging that I deserve this. And I think that's just so important, you know, be it a business, be it politics, be it governance, anything. And I think, and um, I, I forgot what we were talking. <laughs> yes, Fighting I think, the yeah. patriarchal mindset. Yeah. I think, yes, I think just believe in yourself. And I think just keep going. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's just so important. Each and every one of us, um, our, our journeys are so unique. So celebrate that. And I think also um, enjoy, have fun. And I, we also don't uh, live in the present. We don't live in the moment. And I think it's just so important to speak up as well. Eat anything. I mean, I grew up. Uh, speaking up against any injustice that's happening right now for me I realize that I my life as in the past four years I've realized my life was of an activist was a luxury now when I became an elected representative and a politician it's like it's like they expect women to be well behaved and even the women in politics as well they expect them to be uh, not opinionated submissive and also they, th they think a lot of women are also, you know, rubber, rubber stamps. You know, they're, they're representing the male members. I mean, male members control you. And I think once, so, and because it's a patriarchal world, it's each and everything, each and every day is going to be like this. And I, why I said have fun is enjoy that. Have a sense of humor. Because without having a sense of humor, I don't know, I think I might cry every day. <laughs> yesterday, I'm thinking that yesterday, I had a massive fight in my constituency. And because I refused to like keep quiet and I refused to like, you know, uh, and, I, and I think I was sick, so disturbed, I was upset, I cried. But by evening, I was fine. So I think, um, have a sense of humor. Because I think, YOLO, right, we only live once. So, your grandkids, I'm sure you want to tell like very interesting stories about all the crazy things that you've done. Um, picking from what you said, uh, about, you know, different, we find different modes and means to break out of these, this patriarchal system and find our own place, etc. I'm actually going to share something from my experience in Punjab recently. We are very high on the Punjab election and I've come after spending a few months there. Um, when we went there, and it's amazing how just, you know, women supporting each other can actually become a movement or form a government or, you know, um, create a revolution, etc. So when we went there, we, you know, I had access to like, let's say five, six women. By the end of three, four months, uh, we had, you know, Three, about three lakh women working with us uh, as part of our party uh, cadres and supporters and so on. One thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. It just meant that 
you know, we could totally find resonance in each other's struggles. Um, whether it was Asha, Asha workers or Anganwadi workers or whatever, something there you could relate to in your mother's story, in your own story, in the stories that we are hearing here. And it seems that, you know, the minute you talk to women or you support to another, to take your support and give you some support back. And it is really, you know, transforms into something very solid. And that is what, you know, our recent experience in Punjab was. But it is true and as ma'am had said earlier that you know just sharing your experiences your knowledge the amount of resonance one finds in women across you know political ideologies or class or caste or whatever i mean it is a great way to break those barriers thank you on that uh, wonderful note i'd like to say uh, thank you uh, uh, to my uh, panelists it's been a wonderful conversation and uh, to all of you hokoloke dhanyabad janaisu I'm still practicing my Assamese. I think I can do well. And I'd like to end uh, with a very famous quote uh, from a movie called Kung Fu Panda, which has come out in our conversation. So Ugwe the turtle says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is mystery, and today is a gift present. And uh, we ought to live it and fight it for the tomorrows to come. Thank you.